On this week's Fully Charged, I've come somewhere I really can't tell you about. This episode of Fully Charged comes from National Grid Control Centre, which is somewhere in England. And I've come along here to find out more about the grid, because the more I learn about things like renewable energy and electric vehicles, the more the grid becomes the focal point of that discussion. How is the grid going to develop? How is it going to be able to utilise new sources of power? So I thought I'd come along here and ask some people who really know what they're talking about. So we're in the National Grid switching room, and I want to know what the National Grid is. It's just loads of wires, isn't it? Well, here is the um, Electricity National Control Centre. So from this room, we control all the electricity, generation and demand. Yeah. That's what makes this room very unique. Right. So in this room, then, you control where the electricity comes from yes. and then how it gets to our houses. Exactly. So there's two functions here. One is the transmission function, where we look at the physical transmission network right. and the routing of power. And then there's the energy side, where we're controlling power stations output right. and monitoring demand and making sure that balance is exactly level, because we have to manage this thing called system frequency, right. which is a function of the balance between generation and supply. Right. So, Nigel, for the layperson, I mean, I can understand that bit because that's a map. Yes. The overall amount we're generating at the yes. top, is it? The yes. top number. What we're using below that. And then mm. the transfers is a plus and minuses of all the inputs and outputs from Netherlands, France and Northern Ireland. Oh, I see. So some are, we're sending some to Northern Ireland. We're getting yes. some from the Netherlands, exactly. some from France. The rest of the diagram here is, as you see, this is England, Wales and Scotland oh, on, its, on side. its side. On right. its side. So in England, Wales, the main transmission circuits are the, the blue, which is yeah. 400 kV, the red, which is 275 kV, and all the little yellow lines you're seeing there, their circuit's out of service, so that's, that's maintenance activity. Right. We have 340-odd substations. Right. Uh, you see them all in the squares, yeah. and they're hubbing points. There's nobody manned in these substations, right. all controlled from here. Mm. Yeah. And then underneath there's the generation mix, which is fascinating to watch those numbers. Yes, and that changes day on day, of course, according right. to different trading patterns and different prices. And what is the sort of peak of peak? demands? What's the most that the, we use? Yeah, well, we had the peak of peak in uh, February this year. Right. So our peak of peak is about 60 gigawatts, 60,000 megawatts. Right. So today, for example, you can see on the wall here, our, our demand at the moment is 42.9, 42.9, right. right. which is a typical summertime sort of plateau period. Right. So that, so it isn't a flat line. No, no, no. It <laughs> I wish it was. quite violent. I mean, I was amazed at how big the changes were. Yes, and especially in the winter time, the sort of evening peak demand, the demand comes on really hard oh. when darkness coincides with the 5.30 time when people come home from work right. and you get a massive peak there and then it drops down in the evening. Right. And we've all heard about what happens when Coronation Street finishes or East Enders finishes, yeah. where people turn on the kettles and stuff. We right. get big power surges. Right. But also, 10 years ago, you had coal, nuclear, gas, end of mm. story really that was it wasn't it mm. and now you've got a plethora of other inputs. Yes our world is changing massively and right. you can see today our wind is really down right. but uh, if you pass me the uh, oh, yeah. the wind forecast here we can see here the wind forecast is really picking up tomorrow we're gaining up to four and a half gigawatts of wind right which will pose us some operational problems here right. Um, and depending on where that wind is, then maybe there's some actions that we'll have to take. Right. But we'll very carefully study that and we'll overlay the generation um, scenarios right. onto the transmission network and we'll flesh out any problems that we may see tomorrow right. and we'll take action accordingly. So when that happens, at the moment, can you then reduce the call on carbon-based generating systems? I mean, can you turn yes, down we the do. coal a bit? we do. Right. We do it in cost order. So all the power stations submit us costs right. in advance and then we'll call, we'll call off some of those costs in cost order, the most expensive first, right. in order to meet, meet that balance. Right. But there are other issues as well. For example, integration with Europe is an issue. So right. we're becoming more connected to Europe. Right. We're going to have more wind, we're going to have more microgeneration and more solar. And as far as we're concerned here, it's all about data and forecastability right. and the ability to model everything that may or may not happen on the network. Do more analysis here to make sure that the transmission system is robust, that we can transmit power both north to south, which is predominantly the case today, but, but in the future, the power flows are going to be south to north, east to west, yeah. south to north, any way, which way. Yeah. That's the big challenge for us. I mean, one of the obvious things we really need is, is a way of storing that energy. Yeah, because, storage would be a massive thing for yeah. us, especially overnight in Scotland, for example, yeah. when the demand dies away, there's a surplus of renewable, good, cheap 
green generation right. and where the transmission system is unable to ship that power out yeah. and we would otherwise have to curtail energy then a storage solution is that's right just what we need as yeah. a country yeah. but of course the scale we need it in is quite it's a big. challenge it's yeah. big and yeah. there's nothing of scale right. to face the challenge we've got ahead so yeah. one of the things that a lot of uh, electric vehicle enthusiasts are very keen to point out is that they charge their cars at night and there's been an argument that because of big generators running and suddenly you've basically got to turn them off. And if you didn't have to and you levelled out the demand yes. over the whole day, I mean, is that an advantage? Is that a myth? Is that is No, no, that's very, that? very, very true. Right. The flatter the demand curve, the more efficient right. the electricity supply and the cheaper for consumers. Right. There's no doubt about that. Right. So in terms of the future of charging cars, you know, certainly overnight, filling up the bathtub, as some people call it, right. is a good thing to do. Right, because also that's the thing that electricity is used to, in the one big pump storage system we have, which is in, in Wales, isn't it? Yes, I mean, that's we, have, that... we have four of those actually, the, oh, big, the biggest right. ones in Dinori. Right. There's two in North Wales, there's two in Scotland as right. well. So we create artificial demand, if you like, in the bathtub period yeah. when energy is cheap and we pump water up to the top reservoir for use when electricity is expensive right. and when the system needs it most. Right, and that's a very instant, that's kind of like a battery that you can sort of switch on in a way. Yes, it's fantastic. The right. guys love it here. It's, oh, it, it's instantaneous power. Yeah. Yes. So the next step then is how you develop the, the whole grid to deal with all those things. I mean, because I've heard this term used a lot, the smart grid. The smart and, grid, and, yes. And a lot of people go, what we need is a smart grid. And I go, I'm sure you're right, but I don't know what it is. So yes. I, what, I mean, what is a smart grid? What we have to do here to cope with you know, 30 gigawatts of wind, for example, which is, meets the 2020 government targets. 30 gigawatts of It's wind. a huge increase. We've got so, about five gigawatts connected right. today. So to do that, we'll have to do many, many things to make the transmission network more robust and more flexible. Right. There are many gadgets on the transmission network which have settings, and we'll have to make sure those settings are optimized to operate the network with, with all the kind right. of flexibility it yeah. needs. We're going to have to optimise throughput. So, for example, we know we can't build a way out of the problem. We can do some build, we want yeah. to do some build, but we have to make sure that we maximise the use of the existing routes that we have. Right. Because of the difficulties in getting power through from Scotland down through northern England and down south, yeah. um, we're deciding to put, we call them bootstraps, either side of the oh, so country. So not over land, this is in the sea? Subsea. Wow. Subsea, that's point to point. DC. So, I mean, why do we need a smart grid then? I mean, are, are there actual goals that we're aiming to achieve in the next few years? The electricity sector needs to um, have about 20% renewables on its network right. by 2020. And, and what are itself. we? It's, 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 it's about a couple of percent at the right. moment. It's right. really low at the moment. The lion's share of renewables is going to come from wind. It's a quite volatile energy source. It's very yeah. different to coal and gas and so we're going to have to respond in a different way. If you've got too much power coming and there's, a, there's very low demand at night, yes. you can ring up a coal power, power station and say, turn it off or yes. a gas one, but you, you can't stop a wind turbine turbine. Yes, you can. Power. Yes, right. you can turn them down, ask them right. to reduce output or, or switch off. Yeah. And we do that when, when we need to, but it does cost us money and it's, it, it, it seems to be right. a big thing for, for the media when we do it. But yeah. of course, we've always turned down generation sources in cost order. Yeah. And it's part of the, the market that we have and we have had since the mid-90s. Right. In the UK now, we have 1,000 megawatts of solar. Right. 1,000 megawatts and Germany has 20,000. Yes. So right. Germany are way ahead of us in yeah. terms of solar. And as far as we're concerned, solar and any other form of microgeneration is fine. It's good green energy. Yeah. For us, it's just about data, so we can overlay the generation sources onto the physical right. transmission network, so we yeah. can see the impact on flows and voltages, and then we're going to be fine. Right. It's where we don't have the data yeah. is where we get into problems. Right. So I think now, after talking to you, I think the term smart grid is a bit cruel, because it's not like you've got a stupid grid now. No, no, it's pretty <laughs> smart. We call it smarter grid. Smarter grid is yes. better. Yeah. Yes. What, what would you say are the kind of absolute key things that the national grid needs to do to accommodate all that? Well, one is on the assets themselves. There's no substitute for wires in the sky. Network reinforcement, getting more throughput through existing overhead lines, be more sophisticated, have more analytic tools and a visibility to model where all these energy sources are yeah. coming from, and we can respond accordingly. Certainly from my point of view, the thing I'm very interested in is the impact of a lot of electric vehicles, because mm. I think now there's probably, well, there might be even 3,000 on mm. the roads of, mm. of the UK, but I mean, if that goes up to sort of hundreds of thousands or even yes. millions, yes. Uh, what sort of impact do you think that will have? Some people say it will melt all the wires and the whole country no. will grind to a halt. We're forecasting about half a million vehicles, electric vehicles on the road by 2020. And yeah. even with those numbers, it's about a gigawatt 
in terms of our peak demand. Right. So in the grand so scheme can, of things, you can, t- you can deal with that. Yeah. Right. So 2020, not a problem. Yeah. But we do foresee electric cars driving up demand past 2020, hopefully triggered by you know smart metering. Yeah. Hopefully, that's going to start filling in our bathtub. Right. So it's going to be good for us. So now, smart meters, it tells you so much information about what you do. And, and in effect, you know, you switch your kettle on, you suddenly become aware where that electricity comes from, how much it costs you. Do you think that will affect the way you operate? And do, do they interlink with you mm. in any way? Oh, it does very much so, because right. we dispatch our generation on the basis of historic demand. And our demand today, for example, is forecast on the basis of what happened yesterday right. and smart metering slightly changes that paradigm so mm. that um, people will respond and consume electricity in accordance with price signals and they will try to drive efficiency in their homes right. and that'll tend to change the demand curves. We might not be using less energy but we might be using more energy more efficiently and yes, therefore it's I cheaper so. per unit effectively. I mean it's not That's exactly n- right. People's habits, electricity usage habits are very there's very heavy inertia in them. Right. And so yes. I think it'll take a while, even with smart metering, to change Before people's you habits. Really change. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd like to I'd, I'm with kids I'd like to turn the whole house off and Wouldn't just have nice. a candle. Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> I think it's fair to say then that we don't have a stupid grid at the moment. We've already got a smart grid, but it's obviously going to get a lot smarter. Don't forget to join me again on Fully Charged.